from The Australian, here's what's on the front. I'm Claire Harvey. It's Friday, October 25. Billionaire Richard White has resigned from the company that made him one of Australia's richest people. He's at the centre of a sex scandal. And although White is not accused of anything illegal, he's taking a break and will return as a consultant, earning $1 million a year. Why have you resigned today? I'm not talking. Are you concerned about more women are going to come out this way? You can watch that exclusive video by our reporter, Liam Mendes, right now at theaustralian.com.au. Can you believe it? The US election is just 11 days away. Kamala Harris has a man problem. Donald Trump has a trust problem. Today, we meet the correspondents who'll be crisscrossing the states to bring you the best reporting and analysis of this crazy campaign. You may need to open the exit in the event of an emergency. This is American Airlines Flight 5279 from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, Georgia. And on board is our reporter, Joe Kelly. So let's go ahead and stow those either in the overhead compartment or completely underneath the seat in front of you. Same for laptops. Thank you. Joe's recently moved to the States and he's getting his head around this vast, messy, brilliant, terrifying democracy. So it was nice for Joe to hear a familiar accent from the cockpit. Weather in the Atlanta area right now, it's uh, light winds out of the west, it's good visibility, clear skies, temperature of 80 degrees. Please sit back, relax, enjoy the flight, welcome aboard. Georgia is a crucial swing state. Donald Trump won it in 2016 and Joe Biden took it off him in 2020. But only just. Joe's flown to Atlanta for a Kamala Harris rally as she attempts to bring it all back to Trump's character. Do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. He himself has said he would terminate the Constitution of the United States and wants to earn your vote to stand again behind the seal of the President of the United States. On stage with Harris in Atlanta will be Barack Obama. A couple of days ago, Obama joined Eminem on stage in Detroit and rapped his 2002 hit, Lose Yourself. Now notice my palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, vomit on my sweater already, mom's spaghetti. I'm nervous, but on the surface I look calm and ready. The risk of rolling out a political superstar is that they upstage the candidate. That's the big problem. I watched Barack Obama's rally a couple of uh, days ago, and the guy's electric. He's completely comfortable. He's full of charisma uh, and energy, and he's so persuasive. Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, they're the, the great persuaders of politics, and he looks so natural making all these arguments uh, about Donald Trump. What's Donald Trump's plan for health care? Well, he has the concept of a plan. Now, I, I, I want you all to think about this. Let's say your boss gives you an assignment. Says, look, I need it by Friday. So Friday rolls around. Your boss says, did you finish that project? And you say, well, actually, I haven't started, but I do have a concept of a plan. Obviously. Kamala is is trying to use him to the best of her ability to help her get over the line and deploy him as a political weapon. But I think the the reality is, is that he's so much more effective in making these arguments than she is. But this is what she needs. She needs to be rolling out people like Barack Obama now to really nail her message in with less than two weeks now away from November 5. Kamala Harris is directly appealing to American women on the hot issue of abortion rights, but that leaves the Democrats exposed with the other half of the population. There's a significant differential in Harris's popularity with men. I think there's been a a problem for the Democrats over a long period of time, which Trump has exploited. And I think this plays particularly towards young men who basically have this combative view towards the left now. And in Donald Trump, they see a figure, an iconoclastic, irreverent political figure 
who's willing to give the middle finger to to the left and the sense of political correctness uh, and uh, you know these trends of diversity, equity, inclusion, and some of these narratives about toxic masculinity and so on. So I think if you look at it from that perspective, this is one possible explanation for why Trump has been able to say outrageous things from the absurd to the extreme that any other politician would never be able to say and get away with and yet not faced a penalty electorally. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating... In fact, he seems to have been rewarded and edging closer. So I don't think that's something that you can really arrest in the final two weeks of an election campaign, however. I mean, if, if, if she loses, I think there will be some need to address this issue about appealing to young men. You can't just rely on young women to make up for, for young men abandoning you. So I think if they actually did something there, that would make them more formidable. But to look, that's, it's pretty late in the day for them to be able to rectify that, I'd say. In Pennsylvania on Tuesday, Donald Trump was working a different angle, frying chips and flipping burgers at McDonald's. This is not a normal situation, is it? Huh? How are you? What a good-looking family. Oh, thank you. How did you produce those good-looking kids? Of course, the whole thing was staged. The McDonald's was closed. They weren't real customers. Adam Crichton has been the Australian's correspondent in Washington, D.C. for the past few years. But it completely dominated the news cycle. And, it, you know, despite the fact that now he's definitely a politician, he's no longer a businessman, but he's still the master showman. And he's, he's just got his mind on how things are going to play in the media all the time. And I think that stunt, and it was a stunt, uh, really worked very well for him. He's got amazing stage presence. He is one of those people with the X factor, isn't he? How seriously do you think Americans uh, are taking into account the things that they learned about him since the 2016 election? For example, the the, the events of January 6, when a mob of his supporters stormed the Capitol, uh, his reluctance to concede power. Have those things made a difference? Yeah, look, I think they have, and he must really regret his behaviour on January the 6th. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Because I think if he hadn't behaved that way, and of course he would dispute, obviously, that he did anything wrong, but I'm sure in private he'd be like, God, if I just had said a few more things, it wouldn't be so bad for me, and I think he'd be a shoo-in to win. Because the reality is the Biden administration is very unpopular, and Harris is walking on eggshells trying to distance herself from it while she still is the vice president and she still has loyalty to Joe Biden. So it's a hard task. You know, you have the huge influx of immigrants, which has been very unpopular at the southern border. And then, of course, you had a couple of years of 9% inflation, thereabouts, which hasn't happened in you know, decades. So those two things would ordinarily see the end of any government. But as you suggest, there is all this baggage that Trump has, and it is very huge. And it certainly weighs on his candidacy. It has to. Trump's 78 now, and he says if he loses, he won't try again in 2028. He pretty emphatically ruled that out a few weeks ago. It wasn't widely reported in the mainstream media, but no, he was pretty emphatic. He said, no, absolutely not. I will not run again. Coming up, can Trump actually win this? While I've got you, there's a new episode of our podcast, Bronwyn, coming this weekend. It's the cold case investigation by one of the world's most famous investigative journalists, our very own Headley Thomas. You can check out the latest episode and hear all of Bronwyn first and read all our exclusive stories by joining our subscribers at theaustralian.com.au. Cameron Stewart will board a plane to America in the coming days, where he'll join Joe Kelly and Adam Crichton on the ground. His intern will be holding the fort here in Australia while he's gone. I like your furry friend. This is Corgi, a cat called Corgi. As the Australian's chief international correspondent, Cam's covered his fair share of US elections. He was there in 2016 and again in 2020. Cam was at Capitol Hill on January 6 when a mob of Trump supporters stormed Congress. Hey, hey, 
No presidential election has been this close for so long for 60 years. And what I think is remarkable about that, Claire, is we've never really had such leading drama. We've had uh, a sitting president at the 11th hour abandon his candidacy. We've had two assassination attempts complete with a, a bloody deer and a, a defiant fist pump. And we've had the sudden rise of a black woman taking on a newly convicted felon. After all of that, you would have thought somehow or other one of the candidates would surge ahead, but here we are, almost deadlocked, less than two weeks before the election. Over the years, you've spoken to thousands of Americans, Cam. What's your sense uh, now of where America is at? Are they willing to give Donald Trump another chance? I think they are potentially willing, uh, Claire. It's interesting because the electorate is changing. It's changed from the previous campaigns I've covered. And um, a lot of it has has gone in Trump's favour to an extent. Uh, For example, Trump is now winning black and Hispanic votes that he never won before. Now, it doesn't that these and Hispanic voters are still overwhelmingly Democrat, but he's peeling off one-tenth of them or one-fifth of them, according to some polls. And... You know, that that could be a really important factor in a close race like this. We're seeing Trump, his red beat, red meat MAGA base is very loyal. They will never move. The key for Trump is can he win back the middle ground, which he lost last time. Now, in areas like the Hispanic vote, the black vote, and also just the male vote, he's got very high support amongst men, a 15% advantage compared to Kamala Harris. So there are there is a solid constituency for Trump and it could be enough to get him over the line. But on the other side, we have a gender divide here where Kamala Harris enjoys a, a massive amount of support from women. They're up about 15% as well. And also we have younger voters. The difference, I think, between this and the 2020 election, I can't be clear, is that a lot of younger voters are getting very energised and joining this. They're registering for voting now, etc. on the Democrat side, mainly because... They see Harris as a generational change, a candidate, where they didn't get that with Biden in 2020. And I think that's uh, something that the Democrats are really hoping will be a key factor here. Get out the vote amongst young Democrat voters. Polls have been getting US voting sentiment wrong now for nearly a decade. So can we trust the polls this time around? It's a critical question because in 2016, of course, the polls famously underestimated Trump. He came uh, and defeated Hillary Clinton when he was uh, up to three points behind on the day. So the polls were very wrong. And then all the pollsters said, hey, that's okay, we fixed it, we've worked it out, this is the silent Trump voter, we're going to adjust our polls accordingly. In 2020, they were also disastrous. They underestimated the Trump vote by about 3.5 percentage points on average. So that meant that while Biden did win the 2020 election, he won it by far less than the polls were suggesting. Now, the pollsters, like the boy who cried wolf, are saying, yes, we've fixed it again, believe us, this time around. But now, if they have, fine, but if they haven't, then Trump will win because the, the polls are simply too close. So if the polls again underestimate Trump, he will win. And that's a real wild card. And that's certainly what a lot of Trump voters are quietly hoping for, of course. You can read and watch all the reporting and analysis from Cameron, Joe and Adam for the coming 11 days and live coverage of the results as they come in at theaustralian.com.au. A day's subscription costs less than a small fries at McDonald's, and that's not a stunt. Thanks for joining us on The Front this week. Our team is Kristen Amiot, Leah Tamaglu, Jasper Leake, Josh Burton, Tiffany Dimack and me, Claire Harvey. <laughs>